The picture of Canada's response to the COVID-19 pandemic is coming into focus, and it's not pretty. Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. Once again, we're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to protect us. Earlier this week, the House of Commons Health Committee received documents and emails compiled from the Ministries of Health, Transport, National Defense, Public Safety, and Foreign Affairs. And these pages show a fluid challenge for Canada as it appeared the federal government would change tax several times as it wrestled with the incoming COVID-19 pandemic. From the beginning, it seemed as though Canada was more concerned with repatriating Canadians instead of protecting against the spread of the virus. It also appears that Canada was slow on the draw to bring in measures to combat the virus. Tom Korski is the managing editor of Black Locks Reporter, which first brought these details to light, and he joins us now. And Tom, it seemed that the government wasn't all that concerned about COVID-19 as the health minister declared it a low risk. Where was she getting her information? Uh, she got her information from the Public Health Agency of Canada, which has a lot to answer for, Ed, once the dust settles. This agency was created by Parliament for one specific purpose. You'll never guess what it is, pandemic preparedness. They're like the fire department. That's the reason they exist. And are they underfunded, you ask? They got three quarters of a billion dollars last year, $675 million budget. They spent money on climate change, and they spent money on indigenous programs. They spent money on children's posters on Lyme disease. You know what they didn't do, Ed? They didn't stock 11 federal warehouses with gloves and masks and face shields and medical apparel. If only someone had told them, but somebody did. The auditors went in in 2011, and they said two things. Number one, there's going to be another pandemic. It's just like there's going to be another warehouse fire. You don't have to tell the fire department that. That's an epidemiologist business. There will be another pandemic. It's inevitable. Start stocking up now. That was in 2011. They didn't do it, Ed. And it, it, from what I recall, that budget continues to continues to drop, even going into the upcoming budget. There, the budget for the public health agency? Yeah. They actually got a budget increase last year. Really? They only had one job. They had one job, (laughs) and it was to prepare for a pandemic. And they didn't do it. And they're the ones that are now giving advice to cabinet that has economic implications like you wouldn't believe. They didn't do their job, so a million people are going to lose their jobs. A lot of questions, Ed. You know, lo- looking back on, on some of these, uh, some of the pages here, why was the government so hesitant to close the border? I think there was an approach to this, that this was a normal communications problem. I am not saying that to be disrespectful or deliberately provocative. It's just my honestly held opinion. Cabinet saw this as a communications issue. They didn't see this as a warehouse fire. They didn't, Ed. Mm-hmm. And so when the when the proposal was made, everyone who gets into Canada, you get you cross the border, you land at an airport, you're going into quarantine. They waited over a week. When somebody said, stop those flights from China for the mother of sweet mother of God, stop direct flights from China, they waited and waited and waited. And indeed, the health minister said, quote unquote, that border closures would not do any good. And there was an implication that it smacked of uh, anti-Chinese sentiment. On February 9th, they shipped 16 tons of medical supplies to the People's Republic of China. Only this past week in Commons Health Committee are far out groups like the nurses and the Canadian Medical Association saying, what the hell were you thinking? A lot of questions that have to be answered, Ed. Oh, very much so. You know, you talk about those flights from China and, you know, at that point it was volunteer self-isolation, but no enforcement whatsoever and it it seems that everybody was a little afraid to to clamp down early and getting getting a handle on this i think there was also i I think they just didn't have enough fire trucks and hose i mean they were a fire department that 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 now says now says the chief public health officer says today well it was risk management and i i think i know what she means you get a pandemic every 40 years 
there was um, an Asian pandemic in the United States in the 1960s. Forty years before that, approximately, we had the Spanish flu epidemic in Canada in 1918, 1919, killed about 50,000 people. I think they made a budget gamble. This is my opinion. It's conjecture. Mm -hmm. But I think I got enough uh, on the record that we can make that supposition. When the chief medical officer today says we made a risk management decision, the risk management decision was we had a pandemic in 20. Uh, and nine, 2009 was H1N1, uh, and it killed about 438 people in Canada. And I think they made a decision that we have several decades to get ready, even though the auditors told them. And so, what's the implication of this? Well, there are even members of Parliament who have been reading a lot about what some countries like South Korea have done for weeks, for weeks that you test and then you test, you do more testing. So you know everyone who's a carrier, so then you can isolate. You don't shut down 1.2 million small businesses at the same time. If you want to limit the economic havoc, you do your job on testing and supplies, and they didn't do the job. Ed, this event will be a generational, life-altering event for millions of people. And I can guarantee you after it is over, someone is going to start naming names. My opinion. Mm -hmm. Tom Korski joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. He's the managing editor of Black Locks Reporter as we look at the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic when it arrived in Canada and the very, very mixed messages that we received, both from politicians and from the chief public health officer, Dr. Teresa Tam. And, and, and what do you make of, of that? There seems to be one one day it's like, no, masks are, are not the, the answer. And then a week later, oh, guess what? Maybe if we all wore masks, we'd be better off. I, I, I think... They have a communications problem, but it, the communications problem is driven by the fact that this is not a problem that can be solved with communications. You actually need the masks, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They, so they have this entire national stockpile that the civil defense planners set up in 1952. There's 11 warehouses nationwide, so you can get to local need fast. Two central depots in Ottawa. They have a $300 million annual budget to stock those warehouses at ventilators, gowns, masks. There's hesitation to say everyone should go around wearing a mask because you can't get them. <laughs> Supply <laughs> and, and demand. you can't get them because they're trying to order pandemic supplies in the middle of a pandemic. That's the problem. You know, we talk about the stockpiles and the National Energy Strategic Stockpile. Uh, it, it, then now, that has been consistently uh, underfunded or hit with budget cuts in the last six or, or seven years. Um, the other part of that equation is surveillance and, and information. And when it comes to the Public Health Agency of Canada, they get their surveillance basically getting the media from other countries as opposed to possibly getting the real information. And let's face it, China was less than open with the world and what it was dealing with at that time. How does Canada get better surveillance for health? Uh, you have to do your own testing. It has to be independent. You should have independent suppliers. By the way, Ed, uh, I don't want to disagree with you. That stockpile was not underfunded. They had $300 million worth of goods. All they had to do was recycle them, get rid of uh, date-expired ma uh, material, and get an order new material. You know, there are warehouse managers who know how to do this in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And some of them drive a forklift. This really is not brain surgery. That was their job. You know what the public health agency did last year? They didn't spend $5.4 on masks. I know that for a fact, because you know what they did with the $5.4 million? What's they that? spent it on climate change grants. Uh, you get that? Okay. Yeah, I, I know. I see where you're going there. I see That's where how going. political this is. So is it science? Or is it not having the brains to stock a warehouse? Is it communications? And there's no excuse this time because we had H1N1 and we had SARS in 2003, which is why Parliament created the public health agency in the first place. What differences in response do you see uh, for, for Canada uh, between its approach to SARS and its approach to COVID? I think the difference is scope. 
if you weren't in Toronto, uh, you can be forgiven for not remembering what year SARS uh, was. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that yeah. was really. There were some cases in New Brunswick, but that was really a Greater Toronto Area phenomenon. This is what's different about this one, and I got to tell you, this hasn't happened ever in 153 years, where you would have the majority of employers in Canada, these are small businesses, a lot of them are uh, mom and pop operations with fewer than five employees. A lot of people don't know that, it's a statistic. Mm -hmm. The industry department will tell you that, that, that more people in Canada literally work for mom and pop shops, most of them in the service sector, than work for very large corporations or public agencies. That's just a fact. And every single one of those mom and pop operators was shut down in the service sector by federal order all at the same time. It's never happened in the 1930s, in the Dust Bowl years, in the of 1873. Ed, it's never happened before. It is absolutely horrific. I have to say, there was testimony in the Commons Finance Committee this week, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, and this is blood curdling. They have a business counseling hotline. Ed. They get about 800 calls now a week. And their CEO tells MPs, you know, we're starting to get suicide calls. These are people whose businesses were solvent, who were working and the kids are working in the kitchen and and mother and father. And we're putting our guts, this small business. Everyone knows who these operators are because this is where you get your pizza. Mm -hmm. And they're getting suicide calls now. Ed, this is going into week three. What happens when we're on month five, which is what's going to happen because they didn't stock the warehouse with masks. And, you you know, you you had mentioned economic implications earlier. And and let's face it, when you talk about it going for the here we are in week three and then looking at, you know, month five, the economic implications, I don't even think they're fathomable. No, it's it's permanent. Yeah. What do I mean by permanent? When you hollow out an entire sector like that, that is, you know, Parliament's going to pass this wage subsidy. It's going to cost $73 billion. Most of the money is going to go to publicly traded corporations like Air Canada. It's not going to go to ABC Trucking or the, or the pizzeria. When you hollow out small business like that, that affects every neighborhood, every town, every city, every country hamlet in the country. And some will never recover. Some of those owners will not recover. Of course, as as people we do, some of us remember the 91 recession, Mm -hmm. the Mulroney recession. Some of us remember the Trudeau, the elder recession of 81, which was absolutely horrifying. It's the one they always leave out of the CBC biopics. (laughs) 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 Yeah, it was, I was there. It it was a little rough. Yeah, I remember the bank failures. Yeah. People are going to get through this. It's not going to be attractive. Tom, I want to thank you for joining us. Good to talk to you, Ed. Tom Korski is the managing editor of Black Locks Reporter. For me, this highlights two glaring shortfalls in Canada's emergency preparedness. First, we need better surveillance, health surveillance, to get a clearer picture of whatever emergency is heading our way. No more relying on whatever government, in this case, the Chinese government statements are on COVID-19. It was only when it was out of control that we started to see the real situation. The other, being ready through the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile, it appears after SARS, well, it was in the rearview mirror, the federal government decided to starve supplies needed in a crisis. You know, I want to thank Tom Korski from Black Locks Reporter for joining us to talk about the initial response by the federal government to COVID-19. And I want to thank you for listening to the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.